<laughs> okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nick Ray, the Acting Dean of the College of Applied Science and Technology. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our second in our Distinguished Speaker uh, series for this year, featuring our distinguished uh, former faculty member, Chet Hosmer. I'm delighted that Chet was able to be with us today and really looking forward to what he has to say. Um, so I welcome you here to our campus in Sierra Vista, and I just like to do a few thank yous uh, for folks who've worked on this event and made it possible. Uh, Ariella Valencia uh, over there. Uh, we have Stephen Gallo, who's been working on the technology. Um, Meredith Weinrich, who also helped with the organization of the event. Um, and uh, our Dean in Exile, Gary Packard, who came up with the idea of uh, inviting and recognizing Chet in this series. And you'll be hearing from Gary at the end of the program. Um, we do have another one of these uh, coming up in April. And I'd just like to invite Dr. Dimitri Nurulayev to say a word or two about the event on April 11th. So you can put it on your calendars. Dimitri. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Dimitri. I'm an assistant professor of government here at the College of Applied Science and Technology. And I'm also the, one of the co-organizers of the Distinguished Speaker Series. I'd like to encourage you to sign up uh, for the event we have on April 11th uh, at 4.30 p.m. Arizona time. Uh, the event is on NATO, Russia, and uh, Russia-Ukraine war and the U.S. relationship with Russia moving forward. Um, that panel has four speakers. Uh, it has, uh, we will be welcoming Doug London, who is a 34-year veteran of the CIA, uh, who served uh, two tours as a station chief of the CIA. And we also have um, Sidney Kerr, who is a PhD candidate at University of California, Riverside, and Paul Denary, who is sort of the world's leading scholar on Ukraine. Uh, and me, so the most humble participant of those four. Uh, but uh, I look forward uh, to welcoming you guys on April 11th. And I think, Ariella, you can sign up uh, for that event uh, through our website, right? And it's a Zoom-only event. So it's an uh, it's online-only event. Is that correct? I believe that's the... Is it a hybrid event? It's, it's, it's to be determined. It's TBD. But okay. You can register well, at avcast.arizona.edu. Okay, thank you. Anyway, uh, so. Thanks, Dimitri. Um, so now on to uh, the main part of our program this afternoon. And I am delighted to uh, welcome Jason Dano, the founder of our cybersecurity program and director of our Cyber Convergence Center and a former student of CHATS to introduce our distinguished speaker, Jason. Welcome everyone. Um, we are in for a treat tonight, right? So if you don't know, Professor Chet Hosmer. I'm going to embarrass him a little bit here. We are, I mean, we're literally going to get to hear from one of the founding fathers in the area of this stuff here. And I don't say that lightly, right? So Chet was it, it simply one of the best professors we've ever seen in our program, number one. And frankly speaking, our program would have never been successful like it is today without his influence. The way he helped create the curriculum that's in our programs here at CAST, the way he helped deliver that and helped mentor other professors, and then the student interaction. I mean, he just started doing, you know, um, tutoring classes on Saturdays, and our students loved it, and they would come in, and then all of a sudden he looks up, and there's students from all over the rest of the university showing up, right? Um, but... That is as critical as that was to our program and to our success, such a tiny little thing in Chet's world. So he's done little minor things like work on Air Force One and write, I don't know, like 200 books by now, Chet, something, something like that. But he's literally written the book, the, literally written the book on data hiding, which we're going to 
hear about today and Python forensics and whether it's high tech crime that he's been working with or research at the Air Force Research Lab or about a hundred other things, right? Every time you turn around, you're like, oh, wow, he did that too. And it wasn't, uh, he was a guy on a team in the back that might have done it. He was the guy that did it, right? And you look at all these other people that are leading parts of our industry right now. Oh, they worked for Chet or they were a student of Chet. And fun fact here at CAST, I actually took a course from Chet way back when during my master's program at Utica. And then I came back to the next residency and I literally chased him down. I was like, we got to work together, right? And then we tricked him to come here and then one of our other professors also took courses from him. I think a few professors have. So he went from being our professor to being our peer, to being our mentor and so forth. And there's no place you can scratch back in technology all the way to industrial controls. I mean, I'm not sure what you don't do, um, levitation or something like that, but I think he walks on water. So with that, let me introduce Professor Chet Hosmer and a compelling, um, you know, briefing tonight. Great. Thank you. Well, um, thanks, Jason. Well, thanks, Jason, for that introduction. No pressure. Um, <laughs> yes. um, I want to basically share some things with you tonight. But first thing I want to do is thank you for just inviting me to come. Um, this is a, a great place um, to have worked for several years and working with Jason and the team and the dean and everyone here. Uh, professors that um, that I know and we've had great relationships with um, have been just a joy. So I just want to thank everybody for their part. And obviously the team, you know, at the Cyber Convergence Center um, uh, that we work with every day. And I had the opportunity to spend some time with them over the last couple of days, learn some new things from them. And um, that we're going to actually share a little bit about that today as well. So let me go ahead and get started. So we're not here till nine o'clock. As um, Jason mentioned, we could talk about things for a very long time. So today I'm going to talk about the threats of AI generated fake digital photographs um, in social media. But before we get into that, I got to give you some background of how we got here. In other words, what are the things that um, led up to this in the form of steganography and data hiding and covert communications and those kinds of things. So you understand what the history of this was. We can jump right in to see what um, is happening in the world today, but I wanna basically make sure I set a foundation. So we'll, um, we'll try to actually do that today. So as Jason mentioned, um, um, I'm an author, um, assistant professor, retired from here and the founder of Python Forensics for the last 10 years, where we basically provide um, free software to law enforcement um, and the, the DOD to basically help them with things. So it's just been a great experience with Python um, to be able to, um, to do that um, from that perspective. So the presentation today that I'm gonna talk about has several parts. I'm gonna talk about, as I mentioned, the background and history of data hiding, which is basically steganography and moving on to fake photos. And then we'll talk about some of the implications to social media that are associated with fake photos. And we'll talk about the acceleration of fake photos based on the introduction of artificial intelligence techniques that is driving it. And then we'll talk a little bit about, well, what is our best defense against such things? And what are some of the key next steps that are going to happen and are happening right now because of the um, driving um, of new AI techniques in order to build these fake photos and videos that are out there. So that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. So a little background and history of steganography and data hiding. So you may have heard of the word steganography and you might wonder, well, where did that come from? Well, it has the Greek roots of steganos for covered and graphy for writing. So basically if you put those together that yields covered writing. Um, the first um, known uses of this actually happened a couple thousand years ago. So this technology of being able to hide information in various forms came from a lot of different um, locations. The origins based back um, to the Greeks and the Persians and the wars that they had um, from that perspective. Um, the story of Demartus um, is one that is quite interesting. And this is where we actually believe the word came from. And this is actually out of the book by David Kahn, The Code Breakers. David Kahn was a historian at NSA. And Demartus of Aristan was exiled in Persia. And while there, um, he wanted to get back into the graces of Sparta. So he wanted to basically get out of Persia and get back to where he came from. Um, 
he basically discovered that there was a pending attack on Sparta by the Persians, and he wanted to get word to um, the Spartans about this. So he decided to basically do something that certainly risked his life. And he basically took a wax tablet, the writing instrument of the day. And as you can tell, it kind of looks like an iPad. It has the stylus and that kind of stuff. So this is where that came from. The, um, so the concept here is that um, he peeled the wax off of the tablet and engraved the message in the wood and then put wax and a message on top of the tablet that didn't seem that important. And that um, tablet then had to be sneaked by the sentries that were guarding where he was being held. And obviously if that was discovered, he would have a fate worse than death or, um, or death at least. And it got by the centuries of the day by hiding that information within um, the tablet itself by engraving that message um, underneath the wax. Well, that's kind of interesting because when you think about that, this could never happen today, right? We couldn't basically hide something in an image or something and basically sneak it by the firewalls and the content filters that are out there. Well, obviously, we haven't done much better than what happened with the centuries of the day of Demartus. This technique of covert communication using images still exists today. And so this was the beginning of it, and this is where we believe the word um, actually came from. So moving forward a couple thousand years, um, this is a, uh, a drawing that was provided in 1945 um, that was provided, and I'll talk about who it was provided to. But if you're looking at this particular drawing, can anybody see in this drawing where there might be a hidden message in the actual drawing? Anything you know, uh, uh, come out to you to say, well, where could that be hidden in this particular drawing? Anybody want to take a shot at that? <laughs> no? Well, the, the, the reads that are in the, um, let me actually do this. The reads on the riverbank um, are either short or long. Um, those short blades of grass represent dots and the long blades of grass represent dashes. So that represents Morse code that was basically embedded in this drawing that was prevent, presented to Colonel Harold Shaw in his visit to San Antonio in 1945. Harold, Colonel Shaw basically provided work with the um, Coastal in Inspection Service that if you're not aware of this, but when letters come from overseas from service folks, they have to go through a postal inspection station in order to verify there's not information within those documents that could reveal troop movements or locations or any kind of espionage. And Harold Shaw was in charge of that. What I learned just recently is Harold Shaw was um, um, a member of Fort Ochuco, and that's where he served his time um, from, from that perspective. So he was one of the people that were instrumental in actually identifying this. He was a cryptographer and a cryptanalyst in order to be able to identify not only text that might have been you know, in a message that came in the form of a letter or a postcard, but also things that could have been in fact hidden within that. So as we kind of move forward, you'll see the differences in the hiding of this data. When you think about modern steganography or data hiding, um, I created a, this quote back in 1999 when I was working on the SDART project for the Air Force Research Lab, SDART stands for Stego Detection and Recovery Toolkit. So we were doing something at the time trying to identify hidden content within digital images that were basically based on steganography. So I came up with this quote to kind of frame this. And it with data, steganography, the modern steganography goal is the hiding of data within a digital carrier, such as a photograph, video, or audio, is accomplished by slightly altering an insignificant characteristic of that carrier that does not appear to alter the normal rendering of the carrier. So in other words, we wanna be able to embed something, let's say in an image or an audio file or a video that doesn't actually change the visual rendering of that particular um, uh, image. So in this particular case, I love to use the image of the Mona Lisa. So anybody here not seen the Mona Lisa before? You have an expectation of what this looks like. It's probably one of the most well-known images in the world that everybody has an expectation of what it looks like. But the image on the left is the original um, digital photograph of that. And the image on the right is the same image, but it has a 250K Word document embedded in that particular image. So this is what we were up against 
in order to be able to identify and detect content within that kind of an image. And so working with the Air Force Research Lab, we were actually building technology that could identify and detect content that were inside these images. And you might say, well, how do you actually do that? Well, if you think about the way digital cameras work today, and what they do is they basically take in analog information and turn it into digital data. And then they turn it into a file, like a JPEG, for example. And so that process that actually occurs is normalized because it is software that is driving that process. So over the years, we have modeled that process. So we understand how cameras actually produce digital photographs and what to expect. The simple example is the cameras help us, right? So if we take a photograph, um, it will make sure that we don't have shadows around people's faces. So it makes alterations to the images that we're generating in order that we take better photographs. Based on that, we can model those characteristics in order to basically make sure that those images um, came from the original camera and weren't altered or manipulated by um, steganography. So moving on to deep fakes, and I'm gonna show you a couple really simple ones and then we'll move on to ones that are a little bit more complicated. So one that you probably haven't seen before, or maybe you have, this is the cover of National Geographic in 1982. So you might say, well, that looks like a pretty reasonable photograph. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, actually there is. They moved the pyramids closer together to impact the scene, and they added the camel riders um, to this scene. In addition, um, in this particular issue is one of the most powerful images um, ever produced by National Geographic, and that was the Afghan um, woman that was in that particular issue. And that image was also altered and faked in order to be able to make it, quote, better. This drew a lot of criticism throughout the world of photographers and journalists saying that we have to basically um, ensure the quality and the integrity of photographs and we can't alter them so that people can trust them. So this is something that we're working with today. So I'm progressing kind of slowly here, but I wanna understand the history of this and how this has come about and how there was an uprising in 1982 about this particular image and the image of the Afghan woman that was in that particular issue. So we've progressed to then using things like simple Photoshop images to take two aircraft that appear to be flying way too close together, right? And this is really simple to do when you have kind of a solid background and I can take airplanes and basically place them on that background to kind of show that this is um, you know, a, um, something that could happen or a collision that might occur. And this kind of circulates to the internet. So understand something happens with images that are on social media or around the internet, people download them and use them. So now they're on their computers. So remember what I said earlier, what if those images contain more than just the photographs? What if they contain other content in those in the form of steganography, right? So, and the more popular the image, and we'll talk about those, the more popular the image and the more times it's spread, um, that more people can potentially have that contraband that is embedded inside of images that is really dangerous. So this is a, an image from Hurricane Sandy that happened outside of New York City. And this image never happened, right? This is a fake artificial intelligence generated image to basically scare people. This spread on social media and actually made it onto at least one evening newscast um, in New York City looking like the hurricane was actually coming into um, New York City. So this is the kind of impact these images can have because we look at these images and it looks real, right? So what we've done is develop software to basically identify artifacts within these images that basically can identify um, those um, areas. So in this particular image, you may not be able to see this, in this particular image, there are little dots here of all of the areas within the image that we found anomalies within the, that particular image. This is extremely well done, but we were still be able to identify on the riverbank within the clouds um, that there were alterations. Now, one of the funniest sides here is if you ever go to the Weather Channel and you see the images that the Weather Channel produces, those are also enhanced. 
to make it look worse than it actually is. <laughs> so you don't, can't believe everything because those kind of images are also enhanced to make it look a little bit worse than it is from that perspective. So this is the kind of thing that can be go out there that can actually have a significant impact on people as they see these images. So let's take a look at another image that was actually AI generated as well. And this is a pilot flying at about 10,000 feet going three or 400 miles an hour. And he's got his head stuck out the cockpit and uh, is taking a selfie. Obviously, um, based on, I'm sure there's some pilots in this room for the Air Force that said, no, this is not possible. We can't actually do this, but it looks really good. Even the shadowing of the, uh, of, uh, of the arm reaching up and all of that kind of stuff in the background, this looks really good. But again, if we apply the technology in order to be able to identify, remember the whole point is, is that if this came from a digital camera, we would expect it to have certain characteristics um, based on how the cameras take pictures, as I mentioned before. But when we actually blow it up and actually look at those areas of the image that are affected, we can see the parts of the image that were added, um, the tie floating there that basically is, is now not looking really good because now it actually, um, is interfering with the background and how the, the pilot's face and torso was basically embedded within the image of that particular that was actually taken. So this is a funny one, right? You know, not there's no damage to be done here, but just kind of entertaining. But let's take a look at the next image um, that I'm going to show you to basically see what actually can happen. This is an image that is also not real, right? It's an image of um, former President uh, Trump and Vladimir Putin kind of having a moment where they're kind of whispering in his ear and basically having a conversation to basically demonstrate that they have this very close relationship. But when we analyze this image with our software to basically understand if this could be real or fake, um, this is what we found. So obviously there's a couple of things here that are expected where we're basically seeing how these images were pieced together um, within this particular image and how they were combined. Again, this was AI generated as well and put out there. But there were a couple other things in this image that puzzled us for a while. Our software was identifying artifacts within Putin's eyes, within President Trump's feet. And what is that about? Why are we seeing those anomalies? So we had to actually go back and do some research on this to see what we were actually seeing. It turns out that Vladimir Putin wears contact lenses in order to be able to enhance the color of his eyes. The, the algorithm was actually identifying those artifacts that were coming from the contacts. In the case of former President Trump, he has caps on his front teeth and it was identifying those. So we're able to identify other artifacts within images that um, we weren't expecting when we actually applied our software to this particular image to identify it as fake or real, right? So obviously, in this case, we've identified this particular image as something that was, in fact, fake. This is another image that is also fake. This is Vladimir Putin and Merkel basically having kind of a moment, and thumbs up and everything's good, we're buddies and all of that kind of stuff. And again, this was put out there to do that. So we analyzed this image as well in order to be able to potentially identify whether or not this was a real moment. Was this, and this something, this is actually an image that ended up on the news. But this particular image, we wanted to understand if this was a moment that they had that um, were being collaborated amongst countries. But when we analyzed this image, um, we started to see things like the hand was um, embedded um, here, Putin's face, but that he wasn't actually in this particular image, and how these things that actually come up from this actually show with the interaction between the background. Now, when you look at the um, the actual images of certain people, they look normal because remember, those are a photograph that were, was actually real. In other words, those components of that were actually real parts of the, the photograph. So they don't generate any anomalies that we're seeing within those images. So it's important to analyze these images in order to determine not only if they're real or fake, how well they're done, and also what characteristics have been in fact um, modified. The next image um, is one of Dwayne Johnson and Zac Efron in a movie that was created by um, uh, Paramount Pictures. So Paramount Studios actually produced this particular photograph in order to be able to promote the particular movie. 
And so from this perspective, we're looking at this and it looks like they're walking up from the beach and there's a beach scene and, and that kind of stuff. And obviously this never happened either. It was a promotional photograph that they created and generated in order to be able to promote the movie. When we look at this particular image um, and actually analyze it, we start to see how this image was embedded on top of the background, you know, of Beth Efron and uh, Billy Johnson, and basically how they were actually placed on this background, and it wasn't something that they were there. If I blow that up a little bit, we take a look at um, uh, Billy Johnson's um, arm, how it was in, and how it was embedded in the background, we can see where this image was, was pressed against the background. But what's important is, if you look at the tattoos on Dwayne Johnson, we're not seeing any artifacts there because that part of the image is real, right? It's not been altered, it's not been modified. It doesn't have any anomalies in it like we're seeing on the edge. So the algorithm is sophisticated enough in order to be able to identify parts that are the original photograph that haven't been altered versus the parts that were um, in fact um, altered, you know, based on this process. Um, I'm going to kind of switch and talk about now some of the implications in social media. But before I do that, um, this can be interactive. It's a small group. Any questions or comments or things that you want to ask before I kind of move on to the next section? Um, so because we can keep this um, interactive. Yes. It's not going to surprise you, Chad, but I'm going to ask a question about the ancient stuff and not the. It's not going to surprise you, Chad, that I'm going to ask a question about ancient and not modern technology. So can you tell us how it was that? Uh, Dem Demaratus actually alerted the Spartans to the fact that he had encrypted that tablet. That seems to be always a problem when you encrypt something and the other side is not expecting it. Is not expecting it. Um, according to David Kahn, who again was the historian um, of NSA, his definition of that was that this is something that they commonly did. In other words, um, Demartus had a relationship with Sparta to basically know that they would constantly sneak information back and forth in this covert fashion. Remember, this is a couple thousand years ago, but this was a common practice. So when Sparta basically received this tablet, he knew there was something wrong because this is not something that um, would be normal. So they took the tablet apart and basically found the hidden message. And that time they stopped the Persians from <laughs> invading Sparta, right? So um, it has to do with the fact that it's kind of like having a code book, if you will, and knowing that I'm going to provide you with some data at some point that's going to look real, but you got to look closer at what I'm providing you to basically find out what was actually hidden within that particular image or that particular tablet or whatever it happened to be. But great question. And David goes into that in, in the book. Um, it, just a side note, David had a lot of trouble getting that book published. Um, because NSA was very concerned about the kinds of things. This is like a 700 page book about all stories from history. You might be interested in that. It's a great book. And there was a lot of controversy about publishing that book because it revealed some secrets of things that happened that maybe some people didn't want them um, to see. Okay. Any other questions? Any other comments? So Chet, when you look at the fact that we're creating data faster now, I think they, something on the order of 80 plus percent of all the data in known to humans have been created in just the last 10 years. How do you know where to look? <clears throat> I, think it's a, I think it's a great question. And uh, the answer is you kind of have to look everywhere, but th this kind of an off the cuff remark. Um, you're, you're looking for um, things that um, raise suspicion. And we'll talk about some of the things, especially in social media, why you would question um, that. But to answer your question, you almost have to question everything. <clears throat> did it come from an actual journalist? How did it actually get created? Where was it? And are these images that we're looking at um, have been altered? And we can look at that with tools like this in order to be able to identify those if you're suspicious. But frankly, you should be suspicious about everything from an image to an audio file to text that's being posted, let's say within social media, um, because all of it can be questionable. And, and so the, the, the concept is, is that there's a lot of hidden content out there. We, we all know about the concept of a dead drop, right? And this technology is perfect for a dead drop. I can place, I can post a photograph um, on, an, on a website um, that's a legitimate website. And if you know what time to go get that particular image, right, to have the content. Um, one of the things that happened, a story that I should, um, 
I should tell, I should have put into this briefing was we had identified based on some of the things that we were looking at um, on the project that we were doing for AFRL that um, there were images in eBay that um, contained hidden content, okay? And so when we looked at those images, we were looking at images and we were getting hits with our algorithm that, hey, this particular image has something embedded in it. So what we did was we monitored that particular image on eBay over several weeks. And we noticed something significant. The hash of that particular image changed. So basically not only were they sending a message, they were using that same image to distribute multiple messages. So when you find something like that, there are other techniques that we can use to basically monitor that behavior to determine if it was in fact being used, let's say as a dead drop where people were covertly communicating using that particular image. Um, so um, that was um, a predicate to the, what happened in 9-11 and how Al Qaeda was using um, steganography in order to be able to communicate with their operatives. And, um, you know, that story is fairly well told um, uh, from that perspective that they were in fact using that. Yeah, Linda. I have a question, Chet, from uh, uh, the uh, Zoom room. Oh, I okay. forgot from that. Daisy. There's Zoomers out there. So uh, Daisy's question is, does the quality of the image affect its ability to be analyzed for authenticity? In other words, is it easier to analyze a 1080p image versus, say, a grainy 480p image? Um, it's a really good question. Let me answer it this way. You can hide more information in the higher quality image, right? Because there's simply just more ways that we can alter that without affecting the rendering like you saw with the Mona Lisa, right? But if the image is degraded, let's say, for instance, it's a GIF image that basically has very little data. It only has 256 colors instead of 16.8 million colors. Well, there's other ways that you can embed stuff in a GIF image because you can basically alter the palette that is used for that GIF image and not actually the content of the actual image. So the image doesn't change, but what changes is where you hide the information within that particular image. So all images are available, but if you want to hide larger amounts of information within an image, you want a higher quality image. The other characteristic, it's a great question because um, you might say, well, is there, are there better images to use if you wanna hide data? And the answer is yes. You wanna basically hide data in images that have high intensity colors in them. High intensity colors are actually much more difficult in order to be able to um, detect that information. So you all remember Roy G. Biv, right? So if you've got an image that's got a lot of stuff in the indigo violet range within the image, those areas are much more difficult to basically detect anomalies within um, those. So you can pick better images to hide information in um, from that perspective. I'm going to take one more question or we'll never get through the rest of your talk. <laughs> That's okay. Fred wants to know, doesn't the horizon of the ocean show through Dwayne Johnson's waist on that promotional photo? It does. Um, that's a great observation. And there was, um, uh, from, from that perspective, there were other anomalies within that particular issue of, of Dwayne Johnson um, that was there. Because one of the things I could go back to it, but you notice that he had a wristwatch on. And the wristwatch basically had all kinds of anomalies. So that wristwatch was added. It wasn't part of the actual photograph of Dwayne Johnson. It was something that Paramount added to make the, make the image more interesting or something along those lines. Uh, so from that perspective, there are more anomalies that were in that. Okay, anything else from the group? No? So um, social media implications are significant. Today, obviously the internet is filled with multimedia content. It's everywhere, as Jason had mentioned. Most are pretty harmless. And in many cases are quite useful uh, to us um, to be able to add imagery within, let's say a social media post to make it more interesting. Um, they may be harmful, but um, they also could communicate ideas, new concepts, new thinking, and certainly pictures of our, in videos of our pets. However, a growing percentage of those um, in multimedia content have been manipulated to deceive, change the way people think change the way how they act and react to things and believe and ultimately can cause harm. So the question, simple question is, how do we tell the difference between real and fake and fake versus fiction and ultimately good versus evil? So I want to show you another image here. And I, before I show you this, I want you to understand that this particular image 
was created with artificial intelligence um, by simply providing prompts to um, the AI engines. So there was no real image um, that started this particular thing. So we wanted to basically create a promotional image regarding a Buffalo Bills um, football game that was upcoming so that we could spread it around. Um, this is Vinny, that's Sammy, our two um, Labrador retrievers. But everything else in the image was created by um, an AI engine to basically create this. It's remarkable how good this is and how simple the props were that we had to use in order to generate that particular image. And it's really cute. So people are going to take this image and they're going to send it to other people um, because it's kind of cool, right? So um, they're going to pull this down and actually do it. So um, that's the power of what we can do today with AI and just a few prompts and a couple initial photographs that you can basically submit in order to be able to do that. Make sense? Everybody kind of getting this? Uh oh. <laughs> um, Mike Duran um, is a uh, is a Tampa Bay Bucks fan, <laughs> and I had a call with Mike um, a few weeks before the playoffs and said, you know, if the um, Buffalo Bills in the AFC actually um, end up in the Super Bowl with the Tampa Bay Bucks, we're going to have to go to the game, but the tickets are eleven thousand dollars each. And so we both were a sigh of relief when this didn't happen because we didn't have to pay for the <laughs> tickets for the game. So let's kind of move on and talk about where this goes. We've all heard the word propaganda and where did it come from? Um, Ber uh, Edward Bernays basically made a comment that said, there are invisible rulers who control the destinies of millions and basically by using propaganda. The interesting thing about that quote, it occurred in 1928. So this concept that we deal with today at the speed of the internet and social media and the platforms actually is a concept that has been around for a very long time. Everybody knew if we can basically fool the people into believing something, change their mind, change the way they react, change the way that they think about things, we can actually influence the planet and the globe. So that's how serious this particular issue is. It's not just fun. Vladimir Lenin, among others, was quoted as saying a lie told often enough becomes the truth. So when we think about social media and the propaganda that is spread there and how often it's spread, um, it goes to that particular um, quote. I basically gave a quote to Forbes magazine a number of years ago that said in the present day computational propaganda world we live in, we can actually update this particular theory. If you can propagate the lie, create a trend and amplify the results, you can fool the masses into believing almost anything. And the reason that the photographs are um, Im important here is that um, they really enhance the lie because they make things more believable. So question is, how is this then enhanced um, by social media today? There are several methods. One key approach is to add fake photos, manipulated video and audio. This not only enhances the lie, but also makes it more tantalizing for people to repost, share, and start a trend. The concept is a picture, right, is worth a thousand words. Well, where did that come from? Well, actually, um, that phrase came from Frederick Bernard, who published an article referring to the effectiveness in graphics and advertising with the title, One Look is Worth a Thousand Words in 1921. So again, this concept of combining graphics and art and photographs with text to basically make it more tantalizing has also been around a long time, but it just couldn't spread as fast as things can spread today, right? With social media and the internet um, from that perspective. I might say a picture contains a thousand. <laughs> great point. Uh, great point. Yeah, pictures can contain, contain a thousand words and videos can contain millions of words. Um, as Jason knows in the class that we taught, we were able to embed the entire works of Shakespeare um, in a particular video that we were um, actually using. So actually this concept of, of using social media and manipulating that concept so people would share that information is extremely dangerous. So echo chambers in the, in the digital world are these that basically continue to put out information that is the same, but slightly different. And this is getting better today, 
than it was even a couple of years ago because it's AI. So instead of spreading the same message, the message gets changed and modified slightly by AI in order to make it look like it came from someone else. So the echo chambers use bots in order to be able to spread this information out there. So the concept is you receive tweets that tend to reflect and reinforce your own opinions. And you might say, well, how do they know about my own opinions? And I'm sure all of you have had a conversation with a partner or a friend um, and Siri was listening and you're thinking about buying a new dog toy. And immediately after that, you get a message from Facebook indicating, hey, here's some new dog toys. Right. So that information is being spread no matter what we do. And I'm sure everybody in this room has sort of experienced some part of that, that maybe um, at the time you said, hmm, well, I'm not sure that was, that's weird, but whatever. The chambers create misinformation and distort your perspectives, making it difficult to consider differing views. So if you have a particular view on a topic, the echo chambers can basically provide you with information that supports that. They're driven by what we call confirmation bias, um, which enhances and reinforces your existing beliefs to basically make them stronger and stronger and stronger so you can't come to the other side. Filter bubbles, on the other hand, uh, are an internet phenomena that basically algorithms that show you content that mimic what you previously have expressed. Carnegie Mellon, a couple of years ago, wanted to understand a little bit more about um, how the spread of information regarding COVID-19 and the coronavirus was out there and being spread on social media. <clears throat> um, so bots are used to express opinions, obviously Twitter and now X are used to express opinions, share lies and manipulate information while simulating live user behavior. So what they found in their research, uh, CMU basically analyzed 200 million tweets during COVID-19 uh, since about 2020. They found that 45 to 60% of them came from bots, not from actual real people. Obviously, automated user accounts that mimic human interaction, and these continue to get better to make them look more real, like they're actually real people. In addition, what's more, 82% of the 50 most influential COVID-19 retweeters were bots, as 62% of the top 100,000 retweeters, according to the report. So not only was there a lot of these that came from bots, the ones that were most effective came from bots. Uh, from this kind of concept, which is really scary to think that people were reading this stuff and it was actually just manipulated data that was being spread um, in, in, in that fashion. So AI can then help to accelerate um, the distribution of fake photos and fake videos. So there are many different ways that they do that. Um, AI generated photos uh, can be used to obviously, as we've talked about, create convincing and misleading information uh, to spread, again, fake news um, that's out there and a fake narrative. Now, we know what's happening in the world today, and I can't imagine there's, there's probably no fake information coming out about upcoming elections and those kinds of things that are out there. Um, so we have to be careful about that. Fake photos can be used to manipulate public opinion and sentiment. Sentiment is so important today in the way that we actually interpret data that is coming at us from social media and other platforms. Um, they create um, and, and devise inflammatory content that can uh, spread, again, propaganda that we're looking at. Um, AI-generated images could be used to impersonate individuals to bypass security measures based on things like facial recognition. I'll talk about in a minute some of the technologies that are out there that are most commonly used um, out there in order to be able to perform this. But the proliferation of AI generated fake photos can erode trust in the authenticity, in authenticity of visual media. Right? We talked about this back in 1982 um, in how there was this uprising about the National Geographic uh, magazine and the photos that were in that particular magazine. Those folks that were creating that visual content were very concerned about the kinds of um, modifications that we're making and alterations that we're making to basically deceive and thought that it was gonna have a significant effect. Um, so this can have significant implications across the board, including um, things like journalism and historical documentation. 
So in other words, when we think about what's on the internet and Facebook and, and, and Twitter and that kind of stuff today, some of that's gonna end up in historical context, right? So the question is, well, what if it wasn't real? So history is going to actually include things like the picture of uh, former President Trump and Vladimir Putin kind of um, you know, in that particular image that may end up in history in a historical document. So the use of AI to create fake photos raises potential legal, ethical um, questions regarding intellectual property rights and privacy laws. So the concept is, is that people that are actually creating these original photographs and those photographs are being modified, those artists that are out there are also being compromised. Um, those artists that are actually creating music, those artists that are actually creating video are being compromised by people using that as a source of information. So there are several categories of fake photo tools. Um, and this is, by the way, according to OpenAI. So instead of me guessing what those popular tools were, just to kind of show you, go ask ChatGPT, what are those categories? <laughs> and so um, in this particular case, it provided, there's two that I wanna point out here. One is um, face swap apps. And it goes back to something I said a couple of minutes ago. One of the most popular um, tools that are out there, and there's hundreds of them, that allow you to take an image of a person and swap the face with someone else, right? So you can take somebody's face and swap it over so they look like they were there. I have an image of, you know, um, former President Tom so supposedly um, having dinner with Epstein, but it was fake. His, his, his face was actually placed on someone else's body to basically show that. The same thing happened with President Obama and actually having a relationship with this crazy guy that they didn't actually have, right? Um, but basically by doing the face swap. The last one is the automatic text to image generation. This is really... Um, very interesting in what can happen. And not only can it, it can generate fake photos, but it also can create fake videos from that. And all you do is basically um, create prompts that tell the AI tool what I want to see. And then can we actually um, um, see that from that perspective? Um, talking about our best defense to identify fake information um, in social media, um, is some things to consider um, with questions. One is, does the content of a post or an image re and, and related content tend to provide only one perspective or point of view? That's important because journalists typically will provide balance, at least the good ones, um, to basically talk about what's real um, in this and what are the different parts of the argument that are associated with a particular issue. If it doesn't have that, you should raise questions of why doesn't it have to see the other part of this? What is the other point of view here that I'm missing? Does the message images and content repeat? And today what's happening with the repeating is the repeating is not just a simple repeat, right? It is in fact a repeat that um, is modified. So it looks like it came from some other source. So when you see messages that have basically the same content that are slightly changed, you should question that. Does the information provided seem to lack um, substantive evidence? In other words, if it's just somebody saying something um, without any evidence associated with it, the question is, um, is that something that we should look at? Because journalism will provide substantiated evidence and vetted information before they put something like that out. The final point is when alternate points of view are posted, um, are, they dis, um, are they disregarded or worse, dismissed or even attacked to basically um, indicate to you that that's a false narrative that we want to basically eliminate from what you're looking at? That's a really high um, 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 thing that we should be looking at. The next couple of videos that I want to show you, um, the Cyber Convergence Center is working on um, content to basically understand what is possible in the ability to generate video using prompts within AI engines. And the Converge Center and, and Carla Bernini basically have created a couple of videos here that I wanted to share with you because I think they're pretty remarkable. Um, basically, again, using this concept, I can take prompts and text and I can ask the engine to produce something for me and actually create this. So let's take a look at this one. 南太平洋建立了海上封锁 
称，阿尔瓦纳的行为具有挑衅性，可能破坏稳定。鉴于两国在亚太地区的重大利益，这一出乎意料的举动很容易升级为重大国际冲突。世界正在屏息以待，紧急加强外交努力和高层谈判，以防止局势进一步升级。请继续关注这个发展故事，以获取更多更新。To restate that, um, what they've been able to do is use an AI engine to provide prompts that would generate this entire um, news presentation. And we had, um, they had one of um, our experts in the area review um, the Chinese, and they were initially fooled that this was not real. Um, and it looks real, it sounds real, the mannerisms are the same um, from this kind of generation. So you can imagine the impact of this um, on someone that's looking at. They did another one, which I thought was really cool. Here we go. This is, the, um, this is one from Brazil. In a demonstration significative of divergence diplomatic, the Brazil expressed strong reserves in relation to the perception of the interference of the United States in the growing tensions between Havana and Venezuela. Autoridades brasileiras enfatizaram o princípio de não interferência nos assuntos internos de nações soberanas, destacando a importância de respeitar a autonomia dos países para gerenciar seus próprios conflitos. Essa postura ressalta a estratégia mais ampla da política externa brasileira, que enfatiza a cooperação multilateral e o compromisso com a resolução pacífica de disputas por meio do diálogo e da negociação. Thank you for Carla for providing these, and I saw one. I saw one that she created today from Al Jazeera and it was just frightening how wonderful it was. Um, but the mannerisms of the people that are speaking, um, the consistency of the speech that comes from the mouth that look exactly natural, and, and then actually the dialect that uh, they're using um, is, is perfect. So this would fool just about anybody that would, saw, would see this. And if they were to share this, remember this is a video. So now we can actually embed in this particular video uh, millions of pieces of data in this. Easily we could embed the entire works of Shakespeare in this one video, for example, um, something that's benign right? um, in this particular video. So the concept here is not only is the, um, are the fakes becoming better, now they've moved into video um, from that perspective, and now we can hide even more information within the resulting um, image. Thank you. Before I go on, Linda, could you repeat that question? I'm sorry. With the increase of fake or generated images, could you see the wider public turning more to hash validation to determine if an image has been modified? Could this even be a built-in function within digital cameras to write, quote, an original file hash straight into the photo exit data? Um, perfect question, perfect timing based on the presentation. Um, three of the major platforms out there have decided to basically do something about this. It's a first step and is not a solution to the particular problem. But in this particular case, OpenAI is now adding watermarks to chat GPT images created within their platform. So now we can actually look at a watermark, which is more effective in this particular case than a hash because a hash could be regenerated. But the watermark, um, and there are two different types of watermarks that we'd be dealing with. One is a fragile watermark that would break if any alterations were made to this particular image. And then there's a robust mod watermark that would remain and can't be easily erased from the image itself. So our ability to do that, and that's what um, OpenAI is about to introduce. Um, Google is doing the same thing. It's uh, launching watermarks for AI generated images within its platforms in order to be able to have us a way to be able to identify whether or not a particular image or video um, was actually created with AI. So we can validate those. These are first steps in doing that. Meta is decided to label all AI images on Instagram and Facebook in a crackdown on deceptive content. This is a little bit different because these are not images and content that were generated by Meta, but actually they're analyzing like we do images that have anomalies in them and labeling them as suspicious and labeling them as um, potential um, AI generated images. So the platforms are starting to understand the impact of these images and videos that are actually being created that are fake 
and the impact that they're having on potentially on society and the global environment. So what are your thoughts? I'd like to basically hear from the audience either online or here. And here are just a couple of, of points. Do you feel the proliferation of fake photos, fake video, fabricated narratives in social media can impact society? Do you think they could impact elections, create or enhance bias, accelerate social unrest, generate new laws, which they're doing, and um, how do they affect or impact intellectual property rights? So what are your thoughts on that? Um, question kind of to the audience as based on what you've seen. Yes, Dimitri. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I wonder how this could impact war fighting, right? Imagine if tomorrow the United States was capable of creating a video in which Putin renown renounces power and somehow find a way to translate that image onto the TVs of Russian citizens, for example, where or Putin says something super incriminating about himself, or the, or the vice versa, right? <clears throat> Imagine a Russian uh, agency that's capable of creating a video of a US president doing something super inappropriate uh, and how much turmoil that would cause. So I wonder, I guess my question is, I'm curious what kind of, and if simple citizens can do this, can you imagine, I can only imagine what the resources of a, you know, the DOD or NSA or the Russian troll factor in St. Petersburg, what they can create. Yeah, there's certainly um, state sponsored folks that can actually do this and take it beyond what normal citizens can actually create um, are certainly dangerous. And then when you add to that, remember the thing that I'm equally concerned about is if those videos or images um, are popular and think about the spread of those and how many people would look at those and how many people would put those on their machine. And now only we have to have a detonation mechanism for that malware that was embedded within that particular image or video to basically launch. So in addition to the impact that it would have um, in um, um, to the world in the global economy and, and how that would work is certainly serious. And then you add to that the ability to hide information within this fake, um, fake images or video, take it to an entirely new level. So you're absolutely right. Anybody else? Chet, I have a question from Li Zhu, one of your former colleagues. Yes. She says, thanks Chet for the inspiring presentation. I learned a lot from this. Considering the recent updates of generative AI and the evolution of steganography, will you please share your view on how the impacts, the, excuse me, the updates impact the higher education system and the curricula in AI and cybersecurity and what skills students should develop to resolve or mitigate the overwhelming threats such as fake photos and videos in social media? How can educate I think what can educators do to support students to learn and adapt and be ready for any new challenges they will confront on, in this wild world. Sorry for so many questions here. <laughs> That's okay. I think, I think the answer to that is, one of the answers to that is what the Convergence Center is doing to understand and to generate our own videos so that we can understand what's possible. And the more of those that we can create, the better that we can get a handle on how to identify those, to teach students both how to actually generate them and then how to actually determine um, the distinction between something that is normal and legitimate versus those that are not, um, uh, that have been altered in some way or embedded with something. It is vitally important that they understand that this technology exists and how it can be used for, um, for evil but also then how to actually, we can develop new technologies that will help to identify um, those um, images and videos that were created by AI so that we can defend against them, right? Um, so from that perspective on both sides, as we always have done in this particular area, students need to understand what the offensive techniques are and how do we defend against them, right? And one of the really cool things, I had this privilege of working with the Air Force Research Lab uh, for many, many years um, in developing technology for them. And they, they had this innovative techniques where they had an offensive information warfare branch and a defensive information warfare branch. So they would basically compete against each other to understand how to actually create or build offensive technologies and how to basically defend against those. And the same thing has to happen in education. We have to basically understand how to basically do the bad things, but how do we defend against them? 
uh, from that perspective. And that may be controversial, but I believe that that's a technique that, um, again, um, in, in the military and in government, we've always used in order to be able to understand that. That was the model that our cyber program was built on. <laughs> it exactly <now>. is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's all I have, but thank you. And if there are any final questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, and I hope this was um, useful in understanding how we got here, what was the history and how did we get to this point with the technologies and how they actually have come together where they can be combined in order to be able to create even more risk and more threat uh, by you integrating those technologies into um, social media platforms and how you um, can um, now take those and embed in other information like malware into those that have been done um, in order to be able to um, communicate covert information or do destructive things. So there's this combination of technologies that I wanna leave you with to make sure that you understand it's not just about fake photos or fake videos. It's about what we can embed in those that actually cause a significant danger um, throughout the world. So again, thank you and uh, uh, hope you enjoyed the talk. Any question, Jay? Yeah, to, to add to that, to that conversation, right? Because I think we have two sides of the coin and it's going to be case dependent. And two, two things that have come up, right? And two points on this. We just got back from our PI meeting with the DNI, with the Office of Director of National Intelligence. And IARPA, the Intel version of DARPA, is building a program called Reason. Right, and the the DARP, the IARPA manager got up, told us all about reason. It's for analysis. It's it's for Intel analysts, and it's going to say, "Hey, have you thought about this?" And and you know, here are a bunch of sources. And then the first thing we asked was, "Who's programming reason, and what are their biases?" Because yes, I can give you fifteen sources, but what if they're all right leaning or left leaning, right? And your counter arguments are purposefully weak when your pro arguments are perfectly long. And that goes back to that bias of, really? A black female for George Washington? Did somebody think that was cool? But, but so the the algorithms, even in our DARPA programs, right? And our, our case was we're not passing judgment, but we need to referee both sides of that aggressively. And then on the autonomous components, we might not have done it yet. For good reason. The Air Force's loyal wingman in a simulation killed its operator because it wouldn't let it score high enough. It came back and took the operator out so it could complete its mission. But the Russian landsets are now being launched so they can be jammed by EW and they're autonomously deciding what they kill. So the Russians are actually using autonomous uh, targeting now. So this AI is going to be out of control pretty quick. I think that, you know, one of the ways that we've dealt with that on a smaller scale in the past is using voting, right? So basically algorithms that are independent are going to vote on what to do. And then the Intel analyst has to basically look at that voting that came from the multiple sources in order to be able to make a human decision, right? If it's possible to do it in time. If not, you might have to take the voting um, um, based algorithms that we know very well how they work in order to be able to um, identify, you know, what would be the best course of action, right? I mean, let me give you an example that has nothing to do with warfare for a second. Um, um, one of the big controversies of AI cars, cars that are basically self-driving, right? Um, or even cars that basically can make certain decisions based on crashes that they're going to be in. The issue has become ethical, right? So the issue is, is that, okay, I'm a car and I'm going to have an accident. Do I protect the occupants of the vehicle? Do I protect the pedestrians on the side of the road? Or do I protect the oncoming vehicle in order to make a decision? So far, the decision has been made, you are going to protect the occupants of the vehicle because if you don't, you're not gonna sell any cars, right? <laughs> so it becomes economic from that perspective, but it has to get better than that. The, economic, the ethical decisions that have to be made in a split second, when you think about a car accident, you're talking about nanoseconds or milliseconds at most of what to basically do to avoid 
that particular and cause the least harm, right? So, so that's an example outside of the military realm, but those same questions are being raised within the auto industry of how do I actually do this, right? In an effective way. So I, I think that it's a challenge that we're hoping that AI may help answer that question and give us some input on how to actually do that in a way that includes ethics and not only includes, you know, raw decision making. I have a question, one more question from online. Sure. From Oscar. Are there any laws or rights that someone who was falsely accused might have from deep fakes and that sort of thing? Would they instantly be accused for false claims? Yeah, the, the question there is that you need a really good attorney that understands um, the distinction and then um, someone that can actually come and actually analyze the information that's being provided against them in order to be able to do that. That requires a great deal of sophistication in order to be able to, um, um, to do that. So we have to have attorneys now that have consultants that actually um, provide can provide cognizant information about um, whether or not that photograph or video was real, right? And, and that kind of stuff. So it becomes, you know, a, another consultant within the courtroom that's going to basically do that. But as you know, as soon as you are accused of that particular crime, you're going to probably be fired from your job um, until you're, you're, you're cleared. So the damage is sort of already done, right, once that happens. So the early intervention of that kind of data before somebody's arrested is really need, caution needs to be um, portrayed there to make sure that the information is in fact legitimate, just like it is in the other areas that we've discussed. Okay. Gary, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I know you had some closing remarks. Please. How about a big thank you to Professor Osmer. <laughs> Um, we great, greatly appreciate you spending time with us here. Just so, so, so you all know a little bit of the origin of this, the, uh, the idea of a last lecture is not unique to CAST. It is, it is a practice whereby a retiring professor has a chance to kind of deliver that last lecture, pontificate to whoever they want to, share their knowledge in kind of an exit, kind of an opportunity with their colleagues and with people in the community. Uh, it became kind of... Vogue to do it uh, in 2007, when a professor by the name of Randy Pausch gave a last lecture at Carnegie Mellon University, which went viral on YouTube and a book came out of it. He was uh, dying of pancreatic cancer at the time. He was a computer scientist and a computer human interaction expert at uh, Carnegie Mellon, a well-loved professor. Uh, and he gave a very, you can still find it. If you look it up online, if you could just Google last lecture, you can still find it. Um, and it's uh, still a book. It's an airline book. You can read from here to down a trip. It's not a very long, a long book. And that was the motivation to, to bring Professor Hosmer here, uh, because I couldn't think of anybody better to do that for the college than Chet. Um, uh, you heard Jason talk about Chet's influence. I'm not going to go through all of Chet's career um, because we've been here a long time and you can come talk to him, but, but I'll hit some highlights. I mean, you, you heard a little bit about what he's done here, his impact on students, hundreds and hundreds of students tutoring them on his own time, helping to bring them uh, up to speed and think about things differently. Uh, nine books, who knows how many lectures you've given at different organizations, consulting, testifying to the Senate. I mean, he truly is the face of cybersecurity uh, in many people's minds to include ours here at CAST. And so he has had an amazing, amazing career and continues to make a big impact in the area of cybersecurity. But I will say that the legacy that he leaves, you know, the impact that he makes, and it's something that Jason and I have talked about before in terms of how do we scale in the cybersecurity world? How do we get enough professionals out there? It's training the trainer. It's teaching the teachers. It's helping to develop a core of professionals who can stand up and do what he does and replicate what he does and teach others why this matters. And I see you all around the room that have been influenced uh, by Professor Hosmer uh, and are now influencing others based on what you've learned from this man. And I can't think of any better testament, Jet, to your work than to say you've, if ever watch, you, you put the bills up here, right? Right? You watch great football coaches and they're usually measured by how many other great football coaches spin off of their lineage, right? Um, and that I think is a good measure of success. Uh, and you are, are certainly at the top of the game and in the Hall of Fame in that 
realm. So we have a tradition here at um, the college for the past few years of uh, I think handing a plaque. So you can come up and join me now, Chet, if you don't mind. Um, it's in the shape of uh, the state of Arizona. It's actually uh, has some meaning to it. It is sourced from local wood uh, by a craftsman here in Cochise County, and it's sold at the base at the at the uh, arts and craft shop. So we are supporting the fort by getting our plaques out there. It has a little star that represents Sierra Vista down here in the corner where Castle sits. It has the College of Applied Science and Technology, and I'm going to read it um, as I thank you for us. So Chester Hosmer, College of Applied Science and Technology. Uh, 8 19 2019 through 8 21 2023 this plaque is presented to chester hosmer in appreciation for his service to higher education in arizona the faculty staff students at the college of applied science and technology along with the community partners at the university of arizona sierra vista campus express our gratitude for his support for higher education in southeastern arizona at the college of applied science and technology presented at the university of arizona sierra vista campus february 29th 2024. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, Thanks again, Chet, for a fascinating and really timely uh, last lecture. Uh, and then this, talk, this technology will have massive implications uh, in all aspects of human activity. And uh, that's what CAST is all about, right? That's what we're, uh, that's what we're in the forefront of studying and, and teaching. So uh, thank you once again. Um, just a few more final thank yous. Associate Dean Linda Dano for helping out with the Q&A. Thank you, Linda. Um, once again, to Ariella and Stephen for, and uh, to the UA South Foundation for the, for the refreshments. And thanks again to all of you for coming. Great to see you and uh, yep. Terrific. Terrific, and thanks, Yep. Uh, to those online and in the room, thank you all, and we'll keep doing these. So, you know, watch out for them. Thanks again, folks. Have a good evening.